Let me tell you why you're here. You felt it your entire life. That there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage. If you take the blue pill, the story ends and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. You might have heard that the Bible speaks of a time that will come into the world where there will be destruction, hate, and evil. According to the Bible, before the second coming of Christ, the darkest hour of humanity will descend upon the earth. This is known as the Great Tribulation. It's something that's in the back of our minds. We know about it. We've read about it. But we don't talk about it. Today that changes because in this video we break down exactly what happens in the tribulation. And by the end of this video you will know exactly what's going to happen. But before we can break down the tribulation, we need to first review what was in the last episode because it all leads up to this. So if you saw the last two videos, then you were probably just as amazed as I was to see how the Bible was so accurate at predicting the future. Chapter 9 in the book of Daniel foretold the exact year that Jesus would arrive to begin his ministry, and it amazingly foretold the exact year when he would be crucified because the prophecy revealed how once the Messiah would come in 27 AD, there would be this seven year period. And in the middle of that seven year period in 30 AD, it said that the temple of God would be destroyed and that offerings would cease. Well, if you saw the commentary video, we looked at how the true temple of God was destroyed in 30 AD because Jesus always taught that his body was the temple of God that would be destroyed. Look at what Jesus said in John chapter two, verse 19. Jesus was talking to the people and he was talking about the destruction of the temple. And look what he says. He says, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. And they replied, it's taken us 46 years to build this temple and you're gonna raise it again in three days. But the temple he had spoken of was his body. <laughs> and true enough, when his body, the temple of God, was crucified on the cross, just like the prophecy predicted, that was the end of sacrifices and offerings because his body was the final sacrifice for our sins. <laughs> so it was just amazing how everything, all the dates, all lined up with the prophecy that was within the Old Testament. And as deep as all that was, in this episode, the rabbit hole gets even deeper because this final seven year period of Daniel's prophecy was not only about what would happen historically during the life of Jesus, but we are about to see how this seven year period is also a type or prophetic parallel of a future seven year period that many refer to as the tribulation. So. How do we know that 
this is a parallel of a future period of uh, tribulation. Well, we just have to look at some key words from the prophecy. So let's look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And here in this verse, we get a look at the final seven years of Daniel's prophecy. And there are key words here that shows that this is not only about what would happen in the life of Jesus when his body was crucified, but also what will happen when the Antichrist comes. So key word number one, it says that there will be an end to sacrifice and offering. Remember that. Key word number two, it says that there will be during the seven year period an abomination that causes desolation. OK, so remember that phrase. Now, we saw how these key words were fulfilled also within the lifetime of Jesus. But the thing is, these key words also show up in Daniel chapter eight. And Daniel chapter eight is about the rise of the Antichrist. In Daniel chapter 8, Daniel, as always, is receiving a vision. And this time, he sees a goat that rises up. And this goat has many horns on its head. And then Daniel starts to see that there is one horn that starts to act wickedly. And he just doesn't really know what to make of all of this. So, the angel Gabriel comes to Daniel and tells him the meaning of the vision. He lets Daniel know that the goat represents a kingdom or a, a government. And he also lets Daniel know that that wicked horn on the goat's head represents an evil king who will one day try to destroy God's people. So let's see here what it says this evil king will do. It set itself up to be as great as the commander of the army of the Lord. It took away the daily sacrifice from the Lord and his sanctuary was thrown down. So verse 11 here shows that this this wicked king who will come is going to claim to be greater than God and that he will have something to do with destroying God's temple, his sanctuary. Let's keep reading. Verse 12. And because of rebellion, the Lord's people and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything that it did, and truth was thrown to the ground. So we see here that the king is also going to try to bring destruction to God's people. Now, remember earlier, we saw those key words about how there would be an end to sacrifice and offering and how there would be this destruction with God's temple. Well, we see here that the same thing is going to happen when this wicked king shows up. It says that there's going to be an end to sacrifices and there's going to be destruction of God's temple, his sanctuary. So this shows that when the 70 week prophecy mentions these things regarding the true Messiah, there is also a parallel with what will happen when the false Messiah comes. So how do we know that this future wicked king Daniel's talking about here in chapter eight is the false Messiah, the Antichrist? Well, when Daniel was having this vision, even he didn't know what it meant. And so the angel Gabriel had to come to him and interpret what it was that he was seeing. And look at what the angel says. Verse 17, he said to me, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. While he was speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground and he touched me and raised me to my feet. And he said, I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. And so the angel explains to Daniel that he's seeing a vision about this horn, which is a wicked king who will one day arise. And he goes to explain um, this about the king. He says, in the latter part of their reign, a fierce looking king, a master of intrigue will arise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. And he will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper and he will consider himself superior. And when they feel secure, he will destroy many and even take his stand against the prince of princes. 
So the angel explains to Daniel that this wicked king is going to come at the end of days, the end times. He's going to have something to do with the destruction of God's temple. He lets him know here that he's going to be very strong and he's going to have some type of power, not by his himself, but it's going to be some foreign power. And he's going to try to destroy the holy people. And he says that this wicked king, we know it's the Antichrist because he says this wicked king will try to fight against the prince of princes. So the only wicked king who is going to try to destroy God's people and try to fight Jesus when he comes is the Antichrist. This is all about the false Messiah, the Antichrist. And so now that we know that the seven year period of Daniel's prophecy is not only about the true Messiah, but also has a parallel with the false Messiah, the Antichrist. Now we have something to work with to let us know more about what will happen when the false Messiah comes into the world. So let's go back and look at the last seven year period in Daniel's prophecy. So you may wonder like many, how long will this Antichrist be here for? How long will he be causing destruction? Well, remember, The prophet Daniel revealed that Jesus, the true Messiah, would arrive at the beginning of this seven year period in 27 AD. And he showed how his ministry would be for three and a half years until this middle point when he would be crucified. So if the Antichrist is a parallel of the true Messiah, Wouldn't it make sense for him to also be operating for a three and a half year period? (laughs) Well, let's look and see. In Daniel chapter 11, Daniel gets another vision of this evil king, the Antichrist. And here we're going to see exactly how long his reign of terror will last. Chapter 11, verse 31. His armed forces will rise up to destroy the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. So you see here we have some of those same key words again. So this is clearly referring to the Antichrist here. Verse 36. The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. And he will be successful until the time of wrath is completed for what has been determined must take place. And while Daniel is receiving this vision about the Antichrist, someone shouts out, how long will this evil king be here for? And look at what the angel says. Chapter 12, verse six. So someone shouts out, how long will it be before all these things are fulfilled? And the angel, the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, lifted his right hand and his left hand towards heaven. And I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, It will be for a time, times, and half a time. When the power of the holy people has finally been broken, then all of these things will be completed. So the angel lets Daniel know that the time that the Antichrist will be here trying to destroy the holy people and break them, will last for a time, time, and half a times. And that is translated as a year, two years, plus half a year, three and a half years. (laughs) You see that? Just as Jesus, the true Messiah, had this three and a half year ministry, we see here that the false Messiah, when he comes on the scene, will have a three and a half year ministry evil ministry. It's a parallel. Wow. Now, this is going to get deep because Jesus came on the scene at the very beginning of the seven year period. And again, his ministry lasted for three and a half years. So the question is, at what point does the false Messiah come into the scene with his three and a half year evil ministry? Is it going to be at the beginning of the future seven year period or will it be in the middle? Well, to answer that question, it's time to go to the New Testament, the book of Revelation. So the book of Revelation, it's all about the visions of John. Around 95 AD, 
John was on the island of Patmos. And here, John receives many visions about the end of days, the tribulation, and the rise of the Antichrist. And in chapter 13, he sees this vision of a beast rising out of the sea. And look at what it says. Revelation 13 verse 4. People worshiped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshiped the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who could wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. Verse 7, and it was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe people, language, and nation. Now, when John is seeing this vision, just like Daniel, he didn't know what he was seeing. He didn't know what all these symbols, uh, like the beast and all of these things represented. So an angel comes to John and gives him the interpretation. And in Revelation chapter 17, verse 11, the angel explains to John that the beast that he saw represents a king who will arise at the end of days. And how long did the vision say that the king would have authority and try to destroy God's people? 13 verse five, he exercised his authority for 42 months, which is three and a half years. He will be here for three and a half years trying to bring destruction into the world. But in chapter 19, it shows that after this beast, this king has risen to power and tries to destroy God's people, then Jesus will come with the armies of heaven and will finally destroy him. So now we can start to put the puzzle together. If Revelation says that this Antichrist is going to rise and cause destruction for three and a half years, and then right after that, Jesus comes to destroy him. Well, then that lets us know that the Antichrist comes into the scene, not at the beginning of the seven year period, but in the middle. Because he's only going to be given three and a half years to wreak havoc into the world before Jesus comes at the end of the seven year period to stop him. And so, you know, this is interesting because many of us, you know, we've heard about the seven year period of tribulation. And many of us just thought that for the entire seven years, the Antichrist would be here just doing a whole bunch of terrible things. Well, no, it shows here that he's only going to be given three and a half years. He's going to come in the middle of the seven year period. So the question becomes what happens at the beginning of the seven year period? Well, before we answer that, I want to show you something here. In Daniel chapter 8, we saw how this wicked king is going to bring destruction to God's temple. So if he comes in the middle of this seven year period, that means that this middle point will mark the beginning of when the temple of God starts to be destroyed. Now, this is significant here. Because what happened in Jesus' day in the middle of his seven year period? The temple of God was destroyed, the body of Christ on the cross. <laughs> so this whole thing about the temple of God being destroyed in the middle of a seven year period, it's not a coincidence. It's a prophetic parallel that happened historically with Jesus and will happen again in the future with the false Messiah. Hmm. <laughs> So many of us just always believed that the Antichrist would come at the very beginning of it and then just cause destruction for seven years. Well, we see clearly now he's only going to be given power for three and a half years at the middle point of the seven year period. So the question is, what happens in the first half of the seven year period? <laughs> you want to know? The two witnesses will be given power to spread the gospel to the world. The first half of the seven year period, you're gonna see the power of God fall from the sky like we haven't seen since the book of Acts. The two witnesses <laughs> will be on the scene. Now, let me just say this. 
<laughs> One of the most important things I can say about understanding the book of Revelation is that it is not to be read as if it's a consecutive narrative from beginning to end. Because the book of Revelation is a series of visions that John has about the end times. Earlier, we saw how John had a vision about the beast who would rise and cause destruction at the end of the seven year period. Well, in chapter 11, we're about to see another vision that John has about this seven year period. But here, the focus is on not the beast but the two witnesses and what they will do in the first half of the seven year period. So John was in the presence of an angel and he was receiving all of these prophetic visions. And now he's about to see the one about the two witnesses of God. And look at what the angel says to him in chapter 10, verse 11. You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. And after John hears that, then God begins to speak to him. 11 verse 3. And I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, closed and Sabbath. Verse 4. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. So how long does it say? that the two witnesses will prophesy for? <laughs> you see how it uses code? It uses code for 1260 days. It wants you to do the math, which is three and a half years. <laughs> so we got that right there. They're gonna be during this three and a half year period. Let's keep reading. Verse five, if anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. And they have the power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have the power to turn water into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Verse seven. Now when they have finished their testimony, the beast, the antichrist, that comes up from the abyss will attack them, overpower and kill them. Verse nine, for three and a half days, some from every people, tribe, language, and nation will gaze on their bodies and refuse them burial. So it shows here that the two witnesses will be given great power from God to proclaim his word to the world. But when the Antichrist comes, after they have finished their, their testimony for three and a half years, then the Antichrist will come, he will overpower them and kill them, and the world will hate them so much that their bodies won't even be given a proper burial. But look at what it says in verse 11. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them, and they stood on their feet, and terror struck those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. Verse 15, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven, which said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Now this is deep. Because this shows that right after the two witnesses come to life again, they are caught up into the clouds. And then it says, right after that, the Messiah starts to reign on the earth. So that means that this language about how they will be caught up, followed by the Messiah coming to reign, this is likely referring to when Paul said that we all will be caught up. This is likely the same event when the Messiah comes to catch up his people and then he's going to reign on the earth in his kingdom. So at the beginning of the seven year period, the two witnesses are given power to testify about Christ in a strong way 
for three and a half years. After that, their bodies will be killed and won't even be buried. And then it says that they will lie in the streets for three and a half days. And then it says they are caught up when the Messiah returns. So does the Messiah return in the middle of the tribulation? Well, no, we know he doesn't return in the middle because he comes at the end to reign on the earth. What is this about? <laughs> well, remember how in the previous videos we saw how in Jonah and in the book of Daniel with the 70 week prophecy that days often refer to the number of years that something will happen. Well, the same thing applies here in the book of Revelation. The reason why it says that their bodies will not be buried for three and a half days is because this is symbolic language for three and a half years. It's another day to year prophecy. <laughs> Every number has meaning in the Bible. During the first half of the seven year period, we see how the two witnesses will be sharing the gospel for three and a half years. And then it says that they will be killed and then for three and a half days or years, their bodies will not even be buried. But what happens after three and a half years? The second coming of Christ at the end of the seven year period when they are caught up <laughs> to meet him in the clouds, followed by his kingdom reign on the earth. <laughs> so this is and this is great because now we see another parallel, because remember, when Jesus came during his seven year period, what did he do? He came onto the scene proclaiming God's word with power. For three and a half years, and in the same way, we see that the two witnesses will proclaim God's word with power for three and a half years. Yeah. <laughs> you see why the Bible is deep? And all this time, we've been reading it like it was Shakespeare. <laughs> now, the two witnesses' vision is very, very deep. And it's going to take a full video to show who and what the two witnesses are. <laughs> so stay tuned because it will be the second follow-up video to this and it will amaze you. So just to make sure we all got it, for the first half of this future seven year period, the two witnesses will be spreading the gospel with power. <laughs> the Holy Spirit's gonna be doing some amazing things. And then the Antichrist will come and begin trying to destroy them telling everyone that he is God. And then after that, Jesus returns. I think we got it. Okay, I think it's pretty clear now. Now, next question. Is there any way to know the year that Jesus will return? Can we ever know that? Hmm. Well, the Bible clearly says, even Jesus says that no one will know the day or hour of his return. But the year of his return, well, that's different. Why? Because the year of Christ's return will be obvious when the Antichrist shows up. Because we know that the Antichrist will only have three and a half years to cause destruction. And then Jesus comes back to destroy him. So whatever year the Antichrist starts destroying God's people and starts trying to call himself God, we know that three and a half years after that, Jesus is going to be coming back to put an end to it. So yes, no one knows the day or the hour of his return, but eventually the year will be clear. Next question. <laughs> will believers be here when the Antichrist is around? Well, that's a big debate among Christians. And before we get into it, I want to first start with what we agree with. Most believers, most denominations agree that the second coming happens at the end of the seven year period of tribulation. 
because the Bible makes it so clear that he's going to come at the end to destroy the Antichrist and then reign on the earth. And also, most believers agree that we will be saved from God's wrath. You see, right before Jesus returns, the book of Revelation talks about how all of those who have followed the Antichrist will have plagues come upon them. They will be punished, and this is referred to as God's wrath. And the Bible clearly shows that God's people will be saved from that. So most believers largely agree on the second coming and that we will be saved from God's wrath. But the great divide and debate comes in with when the rapture will take place. The Bible teaches that before Jesus comes in his glory, those who follow Christ will be caught up to meet him in the air. And this is referred to as the great wedding banquet. And so when we are caught up to meet him in the air, there's going to be this great meeting, this great reunion of God's people, the believers who have died and the ones who are left on the earth when he comes. And after we have this reunion, then the Bible says that we will return to earth with Jesus to go to war against the Antichrist. So when does this rapture or this point of being caught up to meet him in the sky, when does that happen? Well, there are two main views. There's the pre-tribulation view and the post-tribulation view. Those who side with pre-tribulation believe that the rapture happens right at the start of the seven year period. And then we all will return with Christ at the end of it when he returns at the second coming. Now, those who side with the post-tribulation view believe that the followers of Christ will be here for the tribulation. They believe that we will face persecution by the Antichrist, but will be caught up or raptured right before God's wrath is poured out on the world. And then we will return with Christ at the second coming at the end to defeat the Antichrist. So no matter which view you side with, both views do agree that at the second coming, Jesus is not going to float down to earth playing a harp and neither will you. At the second coming, Jesus is coming back as the warrior, king of kings. And you also will be a warrior. The second coming will be the ultimate battle of good versus evil. And Jesus is a king who rides first into battle. So yeah, Jesus, he, he is not a softy. Yeah, they put a crown of thorns on his head, but he is returning with a crown of gold as a fierce king. And when he returns, the world will see who he is. Now, if you're curious about where I lean on the whole post-tribulation versus pre-tribulation view, you can check out the video Four Facts About the Second Coming. And in that video, I give my perspective on where I lean in those two views and why. I mentioned earlier that this episode is the beginning of a series of videos that will uncover end time events. And in this video, we briefly mentioned the two witnesses and the Antichrist. But there is so much more to be said. You see, when the Antichrist comes, the entire world will be mesmerized. They will be convinced that he is some type of an extraterrestrial God and Satan will be behind the whole thing. The Antichrist will promise people wealth. He will promise people happiness. All they will have to do is just worship him and take his mark and he's going to say, you can have whatever you want. He's going to lead the world into deception. And so there's a lot more in the scripture about what the Antichrist will do and that is what we're going to talk about in the next episode. Stay tuned.